Okay, so we'll start recording here and I'll pull up our syllabus. And we are wrapping up week 11 already. I feel like after spring break, it's kind of all downhill. Um, so yeah, next week is week 12 already. And so we have these three class meetings to work on chapter eight. Okay. And chapter eight is now on hypothesis testing, right? So with chapter seven, we started looking at inferential statistics and chapter seven was all about confidence intervals. And now chapter eight, as well as chapter nine and 10, okay, is all on hypothesis testing. And this is, you know, kind of what I see as, you know, like a main method or methodology for um, inferential statistics for, you know, testing something and coming up with a conclusion that's going to be useful. So um, here's our overview. We've got four sections, right? Hypothesis testing consists of, there are going to be two contradictory statements or hypotheses, and then some decision based on data that's collected. And then from that, a conclusion will be drawn. So here are kind of the four simple steps, <laughs> simple, uh, to perform a hypothesis test. So for first, it's a matter of setting up those two contradictory hypotheses. So basically, you want to set something up, you know, make a claim, and then you're going to test it. Okay, so we end up setting up two contradictory statements or hypotheses. And then we collect sample data, verify assumptions, and determine the correct distribution to use, like a Z distribution, a T distribution, or a chi-square distribution. And then we analyze the sample data by performing the calculations and making a graph and then we make a decision and write a meaningful conclusion. So I know there's a lot kind of packed into each one of these four steps, but I do think it's useful to, you know, have that big overview kind of map of how this testing kind of works. So we set up our two hypotheses, we collect the data and all of that, and, you know, that's kind of like the, um, I don't know, I want to say kind of busy work, like, um, you know, it, like in, in a real kind of industry where maybe like a corporation and they want to do some kind of testing on, um, you know, like a car that's being produced or some kind of product that's being produced. And they might have like a team of researchers or analysts and with statisticians. Um, you know, this st step two, you know, it can be kind of delegated. Like, you know, someone has to think through, you know, what kind of distribution and all of that. And then, you know, someone else can really kind of collect that data. And then the more senior researchers will analyze and make the conclusion. So anyways, all right, 8.1 is on a testing overview. Um, and we're gonna kind of keep coming over this. So if it doesn't all kind of make sense in the beginning, that's okay. Um, so if this is kind of your first exposure to hypothesis testing, you know, it might just seem like kind of oddball-ish. 
But okay, so again, we start out by considering two different hypotheses. And they're actually called, as it says here, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And these two hypotheses contain conflicting or opposing viewpoints. So the null hypothesis is something that we assume is true at the start of the test. And our notation for that is H naught. So that little zero down there, it's a naught. Let's see, did I let that person there? Okay. Not. H not. Uh, we assume that this is true at the start of the test. And so this is, it's kind of like the status quo, right? We're going to assume things are like just fine, like the way they are. We're going to assume that, you know, maybe 95% of all the cars are fine or, you know, whatever the kind of initial claim is in the beginning. It's a statement of no difference for some population parameter, like a mean proportion or standard deviation. So in other words, the difference equals zero. There's no difference whatever for some population parameter. And then there's an alternative hypothesis. So something that directly contradicts this null hypothesis. In our book, it's H sub A, the A standing for alternative. I believe in um, Alex, they call it H sub one. So kind of like a zero and then a one. Different books use different, you know, subscripts there. So this is a claim about that parameter that contradicts H naught or the null hypothesis. So somehow it differs or directly conflicts. And this is what we're going to conclude if we reject the null hypothesis. So you have a null hypothesis, you have an alternative hypothesis, and you, know, you assume this is true. It's kind of like assuming uh, someone is innocent before proven guilty, okay? So literally, the null hypothesis, we assume it's true, like we assume a person is innocent. Now, if we can, you know, prove the person is guilty, then of course, that means they're not innocent. We reject the claim that they're innocent. So, um, so that's how we want to set these things up. Well, it says, since the null and alternative hypotheses are contradictory, you must examine evidence to decide if you have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis or not. And the evidence is in the form of this sim sample data. So after you've determined which hypothesis the sample supports, you make a decision. And there are basically two options. You either reject at H not the null hypothesis or you do not reject H naught, or sometimes we say you fail to reject H naught, which I know is it's a double negative, you know, but that's what we think in terms of. It's kind of like you, um, someone is innocent and then you have failed to convict, right? I believe that would be the correct terminology there. Um, so these little notes, H not always has a symbol with an equals in it. So maybe like, you know, the null hypothesis is that the mean mu equals something. And then the alternative never has an equals in it. So maybe mu does not equal, or maybe mu is less than, or mu is greater than. And we're going to see. 
Um, so in practice, most researchers use the equal sign in the null hypothesis, and that is what we're going to be seeing. Okay, so let's just start with that and take a look here at the homework. Okay, so we start out just determining what the null and the alternative hypotheses are for a given situation. So here, a coin-operated drink machine was designed to discharge a mean of eight ounces of coffee per cup. Okay, so you know those little, I always think, especially like in a hospital, <laughs> in the cafeteria, uh -huh. um, they have those machines, those coffee machines that dispense a little cup, cup of coffee. So suppose we want to carry out a hypothesis test to see if the true mean differs from eight. So state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is that the mean equals eight. Right? That's what it was designed to discharge. That's kind of the given, right? We're assuming it's going to give us eight ounces of coffee because that's what it's supposed to do, unless we can prove otherwise. So the claim here is a statement about the mean amount of coffee discharged. Therefore, the hypothesis test is for the parameter mu because we're talking about the mean, right? And we want to see if that mean differs from eight. So the hypothesis test is for the parameter mu, which in this case is the mean of the population of all coffee amounts discharged by the machine. And we want to see if it differs from eight. So that means we want to test to see whether mu does not equal eight. Okay. So the machine is set to discharge eight ounces of coffee per cup. In our hypothesis test, we would temporarily, temporarily assume mu equals eight and then examine the likelihood of the data under this hypothesis. So the claim mu equals eight is the null hypothesis and the alternative here is that mu does not equal eight. Okay, and so, you know, again, we look at how the situation is worded, you know, someone might want to say, you know what, I never get a full eight ounces. Like, I'm going to test to see whether it's less than eight ounces, right? And then the alternative would be mu is less than eight. So this is what we were saying. Um, about, you know, H not always has a symbol with an equals in it. And then the alternative does not. So that's where, you know, you have a does not equal or you have either a greater than or a less than. Just move this up. Okay. The mean SAT score in math is 518. The founders of a nationwide SAT prep course claim that graduates of the course score higher on average than the national mean. Right, so you guys may have seen, you know, advertisements for SAT prep courses when you were in high school or, you know, wherever. And, you know, that's a pretty realistic kind of situation. Like, hey, you, you know, you take our classes and you're going to do better than that mean. 
Suppose that the founders of the course want to carry out a hypothesis test to see if their claim has merit. Okay. Maybe a competitor wants to see, or maybe some, you know, oversight organization. But anyway, so the null hypothesis always has the equal sign. Now notice you can use these kinds of forms here. That's the one with the equals and put mu equals 518. And here the claim is that it's greater than. So you can use this greater than mu is greater than 518. You can also just type on your keyboard, but these can be, you know, handy. Okay. So you see here, the claim is not simply that mu is not equal to 518. They're specifically trying to test whether or not mu is greater than that. Okay. Right, records from a toy manufacturing company show that the mean time that the top selling toy captured children's attention was 25 minutes. A competing company strongly suspects that the mean time will be less than 25 minutes for the new generation of children, and they want to carry out a hypothesis test. Okay, so you could also just do mu and equals 25, right? That's the null hypothesis. So we start out assuming that children's attention is captured for 25 minutes, and then we're gonna test that it's gonna be less than that, okay? So mu is less than 25 minutes. Okay. How is this feeling, you guys? Is this kind of making sense here? Yes. Okay. All right. Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so here's another one, the coffee machine, right? It's designed to dispense seven ounces of coffee. You're gonna carry out a hypothesis to see if it's different than that. So the null hypothesis is that mu equals seven and the alternative is that mu does not equal seven, oh. right? Okay. All right. Um, all right. So this is an introduction to an actual hypothesis test. And again, I think Alex does a really good job of kind of giving you these interim steps where they do a lot of the work just so you can get, you know, part of the idea. So first, all we did was we wrote the null and alternative hypotheses. So here, suppose there is a claim that a certain population has a mean mu that is different than six, and you want to test this claim. So again, it could be the coffee machine is dispensing six ounces. So that's the null hypothesis. And you're gonna test the claim that it's different than six. So the alternative hypothesis is mu does not equal six. In order to do this, you collect a large random sample from the population and you perform a hypothesis test at the 10% level of significance. Okay, so kind of like, I mean, exactly like with the confidence levels, right? If you were constructing a confidence level that you were 90% confident in, 
that would be an alpha of 10%. So here we still call this alpha of 10%. So to start the test, you write the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And now here, Alex has actually given you critical values for the 10% level of significance. And from the sample data collected, they give you a test statistic rounded to three decimal places. And then they ask you to complete the steps to do this test. And so here's the idea, and I'm gonna pull up the explanation page here. And we're gonna do a lot of these. And again, there's three whole chapters on hypothesis testing. So you're gonna get more and more familiar. Okay, so, you know, like we said, um, Let's see, a hypothesis test regarding a population parameter is used to test a statement about the parameter based on information from a sample of the population. The sample is typically a random sample. For example, we might perform a hypothesis test in order to test a statement about the mean size of yellowfin tuna this year relative to previous years. A hypothesis test is conducted by first choosing two statements about the parameter in question. One is the null hypothesis, and the other is the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so I really like how they're going to explain like the whole thing, and we're going to just keep going over. Um, so these are chosen based on a claim we want to test about the population parameter, and we're starting out testing you know, claims about means, okay? And we are gonna do proportions and standard deviations as well. But right now we're, we are looking at means. Um, so for example, the claim may be that yellowfin tuna this year have a different mean size than in previous years. The null hypothesis would be that there's no difference in the mean size this year compared to previous years. Right, so maybe the mean size was like six ounces or something, I don't know, six pounds. I don't know how big tuna is. Um, so the null hypothesis is that mu equals six. And then the alternative hypothesis would be that there is a difference, right? So maybe you think it's just different altogether that would be mu does not equal six. Maybe you think the tuna have gotten bigger. That's mu is greater than six. Maybe you think their size has come down and that would be mu is less than six. In doing a hypothesis test, we assume that the null hypothesis is true. And then we look at the evidence from the sample data to see if there is enough evidence against this assumption. It's like a jury trial where the uh, defendant is assumed to be innocent unless there is enough evidence otherwise. Okay, the evidence comes from the sample. For a hypothesis test of a population parameter, the evidence comes via the value of a test statistic. Okay, and we saw this before also with um, confidence intervals, like what was the best estimate you know, for constructing a confidence interval. And, you know, maybe it was a mean, maybe it was a standard deviation, maybe it was a variance, depending on what you were testing, right? So because different samples give different values of the test statistic, we consider a distribution for the values of the test statistic. If the value of the test statistic for our sample is unlikely, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, then we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Right, so in other words, if we're assuming that, you know, the average weight of a tuna is six pounds and we take a sample 
and we find that the average is, you know, like 20 pounds. I mean, it's possible that you could get a sample that differed that much, but probably not, right? So, you know, you're probably going to have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And I'm just trying to give you an idea here of what's going on, right? So again, if the value of the test statistic, like the sample mean, is unlikely, you know, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, then we reject that null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. You know, if you don't have enough ev evidence, then you don't reject the null hypothesis, okay? What unlikely means is determined in part by the level of significance chosen for the test. The level of significance is the probability at which we are prepared to reject the null hypothesis as being very unlikely and to favor the alternative instead. Okay, so here, Suppose we're testing a statement about the population parameter mu relative to some value like six, then we have two different types of hypotheses tests, one-tailed and two-tailed. Okay, for a one-tailed test, the alternative hypothesis means you're only looking at like one side or one tail. That mu is less than less than six, or mu is right than six, greater than six, right? That's a right-tailed test. This is a left-tailed test. Um, if your alternative hypothesis is that mu does not equal six, then that is called a two-tailed test, and you get these, you know, rejection regions in the tails, okay? So that's why they're called, you know, left, right, or two-tailed tests. So what we do is we choose a level of significance and consider the distribution of possible values for the test statistic for di different samples under the assumption that H naught is true. And from these, we determine what we're calling a rejection region that contains the values of the test statistic that would be unlikely, right? So we basically say, look, you know, anything over like 15 pounds or anything under two pounds is going to be so unlikely that we're going to reject the null hypothesis that mu equals six. Just as a little example, okay? Um, or here, you know, if you got a sample where mu was greater than like 10, maybe that's the cutoff. And, you know, for that, you're going to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative, alternative hypothesis that mu is greater than six. Okay. So if the value of the test statistic lies in the rejection region, then we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis at that level of significance. Otherwise, we do not reject H naught at that level of significance. So these pictures are what's really, really helpful. Baby doll to give us, you know, the idea, okay? So the current problem, we're conducting a hypothesis test at the 10% level of significance of the statement that the population mean is different from six. So the null hypothesis is that mu equals six, the alternative hypothesis is that mu does not equal six. So given these hypotheses, 
Evidence against the null hypothesis comes when the value of the test statistic is some number far from zero, either positive or negative. This corresponds to the fact that H1, or the alternative hypothesis, contains the symbol does not equal to. So this is a two-tailed test. If evidence against H0 came only when the value of the test statistic were a negative number, we would focus on the left tail. And if evidence came only when the value were a positive number far from zero, we would focus on the right tail. Okay, and so we're going to standardize the data instead of talking about like a tuna that's greater than 10 pounds or whatever, you know, we're going to be using Z scores. So we have standardized this normal distribution. And so they give us two critical values for our two tailed hypothesis test. The first one is the value that cuts off an area of 5% in the left tail. And that value is the negative 1.645. And the second one is the value that cuts off the 0 0.05 in the right tail. So again, look at these critical values, right? When alpha is 10 and we have a Z distribution, We know that it's symmetric, and so we know that we're going to have Z of alpha over 2 over here, and this is going to be the opposite of Z sub alpha over 2. So this is Z sub 0 0.05, right? Oops. This. Z of 0 0.05. And this is the opposite of Z of 0 0.05. Okay. And then, so again, if the test statistic, that standardized mean, you know, if it's up here, like the tuna's 12 pounds or whatever, or it's down here, like the tuna's, you know, three pounds or two pounds or whatever, that's going to be in the rejection region. Like it would be very unlikely to get a mean, not just one tuna but a mean when you take a big sample, right? The likelihood of getting a mean that's that extreme is very unlikely. And so that means we reject the null hypothesis that the mean is six, because it would be unlikely to have a sample with a mean of like 25 or a mean of one, okay? Is this making sense? I'm trying to really. <laughs> so again, in this Alex topic, they give you the critical values. They give you the test statistic. So the test statistic is 2.041. And that turned out to be in the rejection region here. Okay, the value of the test statistic lies in the rejection region. If it's in either one, it's in the rejection region. Therefore, we ought to reject that null hypothesis at the 10% level of significance. Okay, so again, I know this is a lot. But this is the deal. Okay, so let's see another one. Suppose there is a claim that a certain population has a mean mu that is different than eight. 
and you want to test this claim. So to do so, you collect a large random sample from a population, from the population, and perform a hypothesis test, again, at the 10% level of significance. So to start the test, you write the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, right? Because this one says it's different than eight. So that's the mu is not equal to eight. Right? Again, they give you the critical values and they give you the value of the test statistic. So that is the sample mean that's been standardized to a z-score, okay? Since we have mu does not equal eight, the not equals means it's a two-tailed test. And then we can enter these two critical values. There's one, and here's the other one. And then we enter the test statistic. And we can see that the test statistic falls inside that rejection region. So we're gonna reject the value of the test statistic lies in the rejection region. So the null hypothesis should be rejected. Okay. That's what's going on here. All right, here, suppose there's a claim that a certain population has a mean mu that is greater than six, right? That's the claim. So the null hypothesis is that it equals six. The alternative is that mu is greater than six. So to do so, to test the claim, you collect a large random sample. And now we wanna perform a hypothesis test at the 0.05 level of significance. To start the test, you write the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. They're giving you the critical value and they're giving you the value of the test statistic. So again, that's the sample mean for the sample that you collected, and it's been standardized to a z-score. Since you have mu is greater than six, this is a one-tailed test. Here's the critical value, 1.645. And notice that is Z sub alpha. So that is Z of 0 0.05. The level of significance is alpha. Okay. And notice it's not alpha over two because you just have a one tailed test here. And then the test statistic, it's 2.092, which you can see lies in that rejection region. So the null hypothesis should be rejected. Okay. Okay. And here's another one 
where the alternative hypothesis is a one-tailed test to the left. So this is good. So we'll see some of all kinds. Uh, Okay, so suppose there's a claim that a certain population has mean mu that is less than five, right? That's the claim that mu is less than five. The null hypothesis then is that mu equals five. So to test the claim, you collect a large random sample. Here you're performing a hypothesis test at the 10% level of significance again. And then to start, you write the null and alternative hypotheses, they give you the critical value. And that critical value is, you know, the opposite of Z sub 0.1, right? Alpha is 0.1. So this is a one-tailed test. We put the critical value here, right? That's the opposite of Z sub alpha. and you enter the test statistic. Now here, notice the test statistic does not lie in that shaded rejection region. The value of the test statistic doesn't lie in the rejection region. So the null hypothesis should not be rejected. Okay. All righty. I'm just going to stop sharing here for a sec. Okay. Okay, so those were called, um, let me just pull it up again. Those were called the critical value method where, you know, you have a critical value and you're going to see if the test statistic lies in the rejection region, which is formed by that critical value. The other method is called the p-value method. Okay. So same idea. Suppose there's a claim here that a certain population has a mean mu that is less than nine. So the null hypothesis is that mu equals nine. And the alternative is that it's less than nine. You wanna test this claim, collecting a large random sample at the 10% level of significance. Okay, to start the test, you write those hypothesis, hypotheses, you also know that the value of the test statistic based on the sample is negative 1.572 and that the p-value is 0 0.058. So now let's just see the Alex explanation. So all of the stuff in the beginning ought to be the same. Um, but some, some differences here. Okay, so let's look more closely. Um, we're testing a statement about the population parameter. We have, you know, either one-tailed tests or two-tailed tests. 
Once we know what type of test, hypothesis test, we can use the value of our test statistic to compute the p-value. Now, the p-value is the probability of observing a sample like the one we got or one which provides even more evidence against the null hypothesis, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis. It's really the probability that you would have, you know, gotten such a statistic given that the null hypothesis is true. So back to our lecture notes here. Right, once we know the type of hypothesis test we're performing, we can use the value of our test statistic to compute the p-value. The p-value is the probability of observing a sample like the one we got, assuming the null hypothesis is true. And so if the p-value is less than or equal to the significance le level, then we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. Otherwise, we don't reject. So if p is less than or equal to alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. Right, because it would just be so weird you know, to have such a small p-value. Because the probability would be that small, you know, very unlikely. Therefore, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so same basic idea. You have a left-tailed test. And so this is that p-value, the area under the curve to the left of the test value, right? So you get a test statistic, and then the p-value is that area here to the left or to the right, or half of it in each tail, if you have a two-tailed test. Okay, so still those are you know, kind of like rejection regions, but it's really in comparison to the level of significance, okay? If the area is less than the area of 10%, then you're gonna reject less than or equal to. Okay, so for this current problem, you have mu, the claim is mu is less than nine. So that's a one-tailed or a left-tailed test. They give you the test statistic is negative 1.572. And then you can shade, you know, to the left of that. And then you can enter the p-value, which is that area to the left. Okay. And since the area uh, is less than 10, then you do reject 10%, then you do reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So here they give you the p-value, but we know how to get that p-value, right? It's one minus the probability that z is greater than negative 1.572. That'll give this area. So right now they're giving it to us, but pretty soon we'll be doing it ourselves, you know? Okay.
So here, suppose there's a claim that a certain population has a mean mu that's different than five. You want to test the claim, you collect a large sample, you write these two hypothesis statements at the 10% level of significance. You find a test statistic based on your sample is negative 1.506 with a p-value of 0.132. So this is a two-tailed test. Now notice what happens when I enter the test statistic. Okay, again, it's symmetric, right? So extreme values are gonna be to the left and to the right in the two tails, okay? And then enter the p-value. So that's the area in the two tails. Half is in the left, half is in the right. Okay, so notice the total area, it's 13.2%. So you have 6.6% and 6.6%. Or 0.132 divided by two here, 0.132 divided by two here. And again, if P is less than or equal to alpha, then you reject. So P is not less than or equal to 10%, right? It's bigger, it's 13.2%. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. The P value is greater than the level of significance. Okay. Here's another one. You've got a two tailed test, a five percent level of significance, right? It's a two-tailed test. Here's the test statistic. So again, with a Z distribution, these are symmetric. And then P, it's 0 0.081, so that's 8.1%, which is not less than 5%. And notice that 8.1%, it's split in the two tails. So P is greater than alpha, the null hypothesis is not rejected. Okay. Just reminding you here. Alpha is 0.05. Okay. All right. So here we have a two tailed test because it's not equal to. Right? You've got the test statistic. Shade the two tails. Here's your p value. 
And notice it puts half that in each tail. And now P, right, is less than alpha. Okay. So we do reject the null hypothesis because the probability that your sample would have had, you know, a test statistic like this, it's so very small, right? It would be really unusual. So we're going to, re you know, that's assuming that the null hypothesis is true. It would just be so weird. So that's why we reject, we reject it. Okay, I'm trying to have that make sense. Okay. And have we done a one-tailed test? <laughs> They're all starting to look the same to me now. Let's see. It's a lot of two-tailed tests. Here's a one-tailed test. Suppose there's a claim that the mean is greater than eight. The null hypothesis always has the equal sign. You want to test this, you collect a large random sample, you want to test it at alpha equals 0 0.10, the 10% level. Okay, so this is a one-tailed test. The value of the test statistic is 0 0.719. The p-value, it's to the right because it's greater than. The p-value is 0 0.236, which is not less than 10%. It's greater than 10%. So the null hypothesis is not rejected. Okay. Hopefully this is starting to feel a little better the more we do these. So we've done the critical value method and we've done the p-value method. And I really just want to do one more topic tonight and then next week, you know, because some of these I think are good to just do together. And also I think, you know, we're just starting to see a whole new, you know, concept. And I think it's great that we have, I feel like this kind of extra day, because normally we do a chapter in two Zooms, but we have three right now. So, uh, so yeah, I want to make this be the last one for tonight. It's a good kind of breaking away point. So suppose we want to conduct a hypothesis test of the claim that for middle-aged adults, the population mean of their cholesterol levels is less than 194.8. So notice that's the claim, right? The claim is that mu is less than that. Um, so we choose a random sample. And the sample has a mean of 193.8 and a standard deviation of 19.5. Now, for each of the following sampling scenarios, we're going to choose an appropriate test statistic for our hypothesis on the population mean and then calculate that statistic. And so, pull this back up, our lecture notes.
Okay, so first, to remind you of when we use Z for the sampling distribution and when we use T, right? I've tried to kind of summarize down here. Right, so when you have a normal distribution, if you know sigma, then we use Z. If you don't know sigma or the population standard deviation, then you use T. But when you don't know sigma, but the sample size is large, we can still use Z as a good approximation. So it's acceptable to use Z for these big sample sizes. So again, these are for normal distributions or approximately normal. And then suppose that the population is not normal or we don't know that much about it. If the sample size is large and you know sigma, then you can use Z. Right? If the sample size is large and you don't know sigma, then you can use Z or T. And you can use Z because for large samples, it's a good approximation of T. So that is a similarity here, you know, even if sigma is not known, if you have a big sample, you can still use Z. Um, if the sample size is small, you know, regardless of whether or not you know sigma, then it's unclear which distribution to use. Okay. And then these are the two formulas to calculate the test statistics. For a Z test statistic, it's the sample mean minus that um, null hypothesis value divided by sigma over the square root of N. And same basic idea for T, but you've got the sample standard deviation. Okay. So for this first one, oh, let's see. So suppose we want to conduct a hypothesis test to draw a conclusion about how an unknown population mean compares to a number mu naught, right? Because that is, you know, the null hypothesis. We're, we're going to start out assuming that mu equals something. So that's called mu naught, right? That's the mu for H naught. So for this test, suppose we have a random sample of size N, we may or may not know the population standard deviation, but we have found that the sample mean is X bar and the sample standard deviation is S. To conduct our hypothesis test, we need to calculate a test statistic. Which test statistic we use depends on various conditions and the following information helps us decide uh, Z is associated with the standard normal distribution and T is associated with the T distribution. So again, if you know the population is known to be normal, if sigma is known, then you use Z. If sigma is unknown, then you use T. If the sample size is large, it's still acceptable to use Z, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, and so here's the current problem, right? You have mu naught 194.8, the sample mean X bar and the sample standard deviation. So for the first scenario, we're given that the sample size has N equals 11. So that's a small sample size. It is a normal distribution and you know the standard deviation. If you know the standard deviation, for a normal distribution, then you can use the Z test statistic. And then you can test that, right? It's X bar minus mu naught over sigma divided by the square root of N. So again, you're gonna, you know, transform that sample mean, that raw score, like, you know, the mean tuna weight was like 15 pounds in your sample, but to get it to a Z score, right? You're gonna subtract mu and divide by sigma over the square root of N. And that standardizes it. So you know how far away from zero, okay? 
In the second scenario, uh, you have a small sample size and you don't know very much about the distribution. So it's unclear which test statistic to use. Okay. Let's see another scenario maybe. Okay. We want to conduct a hypothesis test of the claim that the population mean score on a nationwide examination in biology is different from 530. Okay. So that is our mu naught right here. So we choose a random sample of exam scores. The sample mean is 516. And the sample standard deviation is 73. Okay, so in this first one, you have a small sample size. It's less than 30. And it's from a distribution about which we know very little. So it's unclear which um, test statistic to use, right? The next one, it's a normal distribution. It's a small sample size and you don't know the standard deviation. So this is gonna be a T distribution. It's normally distributed. It's a small sample size, so we can't, and with the bigger sample size, you could approximate it with Z, but nope, you're going to use a T distribution. And so to calculate the T statistic, it's X bar minus mu naught over S minus square root of N. Okay. So T equals X bar was 516 minus mu naught, which was 530, all over S, which was 73, over the square root of N, Um, and th that's given us here is 11. Okay. So we do 516 minus 530 divided by 73 divided by the square root of 11, okay? Does it not say how many decimal places? Mm. Oh, here it is. Round your answers to two decimal places. So negative 0 0.64. Oops, negative 0 0.64. Okay. Okay. And, you know, next week we're going to put it all together. You're going to write the hypotheses statements. You're going to determine what kind of test statistic to calculate. And you're going to, you know, perform a hypothesis test. Like a whole thing. And really, you guys, this is so powerful. You know, you could actually conduct a real um, test. Anyway, 
Isn't there anything other than these cholesterol levels, biology exam, else? All right, how about this? We want to conduct a hypothesis test of the claim that the population mean reading speed of second graders is different from 27.5 words per minute. Okay, so maybe I should put down here. Uh, the sample has a mean of 27.2 words per minute and a sample standard deviation of 2.2. All right, again, this first one has a small sample size and we don't know much about the distribution, so it's unclear. The next one is normally distributed and we don't know what the standard deviation is, so that's gonna be a T distribution. And so again, we do, I guess I could pull it up at the same time. Right, we use that formula there. So it's X bar minus mu naught over S divided by the square root of 10. And then we can just do that calculation. Okay. And then round to two decimal places. So negative 0 0.43. Okay. All right, so I do want to just stop here, and then we could carry on with these Z and P tests and all of that. <laughs> but I feel like kind of once we start, it's good to do it all, you know, on this, in the same class. And there's no need to do, you know, like over half of the homework today. So um, we'll take it easy after the old test <laughs> and